Hello everyone, I'm Pringo Dikdo Nugroho, a senior consultant nephrologist from Jakarta, Indonesia, and general secretary of Indonesian Society of Nephrologists. Uh, good evening for colleagues in Indonesia, Malaysia, and Pakistan, and good morning for colleagues in United States. Welcome to our uh, PD webinar. This webinar is the third of PD webinar series, which is held in collaboration with between ISPD and Indonesia Society of Nephrology. We are honored to have with us Prof. Uh, Scott Lipman, uh, the chairperson of Education Committee of uh, the ISPD, and Dr. Tarangsak Kanajabuk, the chairperson of the ISPD Asia Pacific Chapter. And we have three excellent speakers, Dr. Muhammad Ahad Koyum from Pakistan, Dr. Afiatin Makmun from Indonesia, and Ms. Nor Asikin from Malaysia. This session will be chaired by Dr. Yeni Kandarini from Bali, Indonesia. Before starting the webinar, I would like to ask uh, Prof. Scott Lipman to deliver the opening remarks as uh, Chairperson uh, of Education Committee of ISPD. Please, Prof. Scott. Thank you very much, Dr. Pringo. I appreciate that. Um, hi, everyone. Good evening. Uh, my name is Scott Liebman. As, as mentioned, I am the chair of the Education Committee of the International Society of Peritoneal Dialysis. Um, on behalf of myself and my colleague, Dr. Isaac Teitelbaum, who could not join us, but is the chairperson of the ISPD International Liaison Committee, um, it is our pleasure to welcome you to this third webinar held in conjunction with the Indonesian Society of Nephrology. Um, we will have three talks during this webinar, as mentioned. Um, the first talk will be establishing a CAPD uh, facility in Pakistan, looking perhaps at some similarities uh, in, in, in building, um, uh, building up PD in, in Indonesia as well. The second will be PD care in Indonesia, challenges and opportunities. And the third will uh, be uh, the role of the peritoneal dialysis nurse, obviously a, a very extremely important colleague and collaborator in caring for our patients, um, the role of the nurse in managing PD patients. Um, so as the webinar series concludes, I would just like to take this time to thank everyone who's been involved, all the speakers and moderators and, and chairs. And I wanted to give a special thanks to someone in the background who you won't see, um, but is doing a lot of work to bring this to you. Uh, Miguel Gallardo is the administrator from the ISPD, and he kind of collates and gets all this together. So we really appreciate his efforts in doing this. Um, and I just wanted to end by saying, I hope this webinar series has been helpful for you. And I hope it helps uh, to increase PD use and appreciation in Indonesia. And with that, I would like to turn it back to the chair, uh, the moderator for this session, Dr. Yeni. Thank you so very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Prof. Scott. Uh, this session will be chaired by Dr. Yanni Kandarani from Bali, Indonesia. Please, Dr. Yanni. Thank you, Dr. Pringu. Good evening for colleagues in Indonesia, Malaysia, and Pakistan. And uh, good morning for colleagues in the U.S. I am Kandarani from Bali, Indonesia. It's a precious chance for me uh, to be moderator of this webinar today. Uh, in this webinar, uh, the third uh, webinar, uh, collaboration of ASPD and Indonesian Society of Nephrology, uh, with, uh, we will talk about uh, structural requirement for a successful peritoneal dialysis program. I would like to welcome to our uh, speaker today, uh, Dr. Muhammad Ahad Kayum from Pakistan. And, Dr. Afiatin Makmun from Indonesia and Nurse Norasikin Muhammad Mauh Isan from Malaysia. And welcome to all of the attendees uh, tonight. Uh, our speaker uh, today have years of experience uh, and uh, knowledge in uh, nephrologists and peritoneal dialysis. And we are honored to have them with us uh, today. And this webinar will be divided in two sections. In the first section, uh, we'll presentation from the all of speaker, and in the end, uh, we'll uh, section of question and answer. 
I'd like to leave question uh, at the end of this webinar. And uh, before we start the webinar, uh, I would like to present a short uh, presentation uh, about the ethic. Uh, this is uh, uh, ethic on paternal dialysis. So I will talk in Indonesia uh, for the audience from Indonesia of ethic and PD. I will uh, share screen. Ah, ya, yeah, selamat malam, uh, para audien. Ya, yeah, saya akan menyampaikan tentang uh, aspek et etik dari pernal dialisis. Uh, jadi, uh, seperti kita ketahui, bahwa ada empat hal yang... Uh, penting yang kita perhatikan dalam etik uh, saat kita melakukan pertawasana pasien-pasien dengan uh, dialisis. Tentu saja berlaku juga umum untuk yang lain. Jadi yang pertama, otonomi, di mana kita harus memberikan kemampuan untuk melakukan uh, pasien untuk menentukan apa yang sesuai untuk pasien. Kemudian pada prinsip beneficence, uh, kita uh, harus memberikan kebaikan atau memberikan manfaat terapi yang kita berikan kepada pasien. Dan pada prinsip non maleficent kita harus mempertimbangkan segala hal yang mungkin akan berpengaruh buruk terhadap terapi yang kita berikan. Dan yang terakhir, justice, itu terdapat keadilan bagi pasien maupun masyarakat terhadap kemungkinan yang lain seperti alokasi sumber daya dan sumber daya yang harus konsisten, transparan, adil, dan seterusnya. Dalam uh, etik uh, pada pasien dialisis, ada beberapa hal yang harus kita perhatikan. Yang seperti yang tadi saya sampaikan, yaitu otonomi, di mana kita harus memperhatikan, uh, menghargai keputusan pasien, dan mendiskusikan kepada pasien ter termasuk memilih uh, terapi yang terbaik untuk dialisisnya. Uh, jadi kita di sini juga harus memperhatikan tepetanal dialisis, hemodialisis, maupun transplan. Pada prinsip beneficent, kita harus uh, memperhatikan juga bahwa terapi yang kita berikan bermanfaat untuk pasien. Mana kita menurunkan mortalitas dan morbiditas dan juga kita memperbaiki kualitas hidup pasien. Dan mungkin kita bisa mempersiapkan seorang pasien untuk menerima terapi dialisis uh, yang advance dan juga mempersiapkan untuk terapi transplant. Dan tentu saja pada prinsip non maleficent juga kita harus menghindari hal-hal yang merugikan kepada pasien dan pada prinsip justice ya kita harus me memperlihatkan bahwa kita memberikan uh, keadilan dalam mendapatkan terapi dialisis. Khusus untuk uh, pasien dengan pernal dialisis, uh, mengingat pernal dialisis adalah merupakan home terapi uh, dialisis, jadi uh, kita tentu harus mempertimbangkan apakah lingkungan di rumah itu memang me memenuhi syarat untuk melakukan terapi uh, pernal dialisis, misalnya keamanan, kebersihan, dan seterusnya. Dan apakah kondisi ini akan bisa kita pertahankan dan siapa yang bertanggung jawab terhadap pemantauan ini. Dan juga keterlibatan dari keluarga pasien dan pasien sendiri sangat penting dalam pernal dialisis ini. Sehingga kita harus menilai juga ini uh, bagaimana keterlibatan keluarga dalam terapi dialisis pada pasien-pasien yang menjalani pernal dialisis di rumah. Uh, yang lain juga harus kita perhatikan dalam pernal dialisis, Uh, adalah bahwa pasien ini uh, pada yang jangka panjang tentu kita akan ada potensial risiko yang harus kita pertimbangkan dan kita assess. Jadi kita harus selalu memperhatikan hal tersebut dan mendiskusikan kepada pasien ada kemungkinan bahwa apakah akan bisa PD berjalan terus ataupun harus kombinasi dengan hemodialisis. Dan sebagai dokter, uh, kita juga harus uh, memberikan uh, keluasan kepada pasien, pilihan pasien untuk bisa mempertahankan Uh, apa yang akan menjadi uh, kualitas hidup dari pasien dan memilih terapi yang terbaik untuk pasien. Demikian tentang uh, uh, etik. Uh, this is the end of uh, my presentation about the etik. And thank you so much for the, your attention. And then uh, we move to the next agenda. Uh, the first speaker here, uh, we will... Uh, Uh, will be de delivered by Dr. Muhammad Ahad Akrayum from Pakistan. I will... Uh, yes. Dr. Muhammad Kayum uh, will uh, uh, present the uh, topic uh, establishing of CRPD facility in Pakistan, uh, lesson and uh, service development.
Dr. Muhammad Kayum uh, now is a consultant nephrologist uh, from uh, Pakistan and currently serves as medical director and chief of nephrology at one of the large uh, trust hospitals of Asia and Pakistan. Uh, now I would like to invite uh, Dr. Muhammad Kayum uh, to present it, uh, the presentation and hello Dr. Ahad. Okay, uh, time is yours. Yes. So can you just confirm if you can see my screen first? Yes, we can see clear. Oh, thanks. Okay, that's fine. Okay. So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum and good evening, uh, everybody. So, first and foremost, I would just like to thank uh, the ISPD and the Indonesian Society of Nephrology for inviting me to be a part of this wonderful, wonderful webinar series. Uh, my name is Ahad. I'm a consultant nephrologist based out of Pakistan, and I am the current deputy chair of the International Liaison Committee of the ISPD. Um, so first and foremost, um, after thanking you, I would just like to declare that we, I do not have any competing interest nor any disclosures, and I'm just going to be talking about how we developed peritoneal dialysis in Pakistan over the last decade or so. We had only 19 to 20 patients on peritoneal dialysis about 10 years ago, and that number has increased by 20-fold since then. Um, so there were a lot of obstacles, what, how we try to get over them. So what were our lessons learned? I'm just going to try and sort of shed some light there. Um, so firstly, um, you know, what we did was we used the resources which are already present there. So it was not a question of reinventing the wheel. There is a lot of free resources out there by PD leaders globally, uh, started from Professor Fred Frinkelstein based out of Yale to a team in Sri Lanka. So these were the three main papers that we used to make the roadmap. Uh, so step one, which we started for as far as 10 years ago, was that initially what we wanted to do was get the population motivated. Because there were the patients were so less, nobody really knew what peritoneal dialysis was all about. So we needed to go to the healthcare professionals, whether it was medical students, nurses, simple medical surgical doctors, not only nephrologists and sort of say that peritoneal, hey, it's there, it works. And, and I'll later on go on to show that, you know, it's more suited to Pakistan as well, considering it's a country which is, uh, you know, strives for energy. So there's a lot of load shedding. Electricity isn't available 24-7. So running hemodialysis units wasn't just feasible. And peritoneal dialysis is a therapy which is done at home in joint families. So there is a lot of people who are motivated and able to help this. So the first thing was to get motivated, that the population motivated that, listen, peritoneal dialysis works. And, you know, if it's not better, it's as be good as hemodialysis. Essentially, what was happening was that every patient who was ending up with end-stage renal disease was being siphoned off to hemodialysis. So the first problem was this. Unfortunately, Pakistan spends less than 1% of its GDP on health. And I shudder to think what amount of that 1% would go to renal health care. And this is actually a staggering feature, um, you know, a figure that you know, it costs around $3,000 to maintain a, a single patient on hemodialysis in Pakistan. But if you compare that to what is the per capita income, what does the average Pakistani make in one year? That is $1,200. So there is a huge discrepancy. Now that $1,200, that particular person has to pay for food, utilities, education, and other healthcare problems as well. So essentially having going on to dialysis is an, un, unfortunately a death sentence for most Pakistanis. What happens is that as a result, only 10% of patients who ended up having uh, dial, uh, who need, uh, you know, go on to need dialysis, only 10% get that. And the rest of the 90%, unfortunately, I shudder to think what happens to them, but clearly without dialysis, they just pass away. So clearly, if we keep the, kept on doing the same thing, that and expect a different result, that is the precise definition of insanity. So, so we needed to do something. So what we were doing was that we went to all any with television shows, radios, wherever we wanted to go. We just went there and started 
pushing the idea that peritoneal dialysis is the way to the future. This paper has clearly showed that in 90% of the countries across the world, peritoneal dialysis is cheaper than hemodialysis. This was again replicated in another study based out of Saudi Arabia, in which he also highlighted that, you know, there's lesser dose of EPO requirements, lesser expenditure on electricity. The um, Pakistan has a lot of problem with water as well, uh, with climate change. So, you know, uh, you know, there's about 160 liters of water being used for hemodialysis, if you compare that to CAPD, which is eight liters only. Similar study done out of India as well. So we just keep talk, kept on. I'm not going, this lecture is not going to be, talk is not going to be about peritoneal dialysis versus hemodialysis. It was just that we were just talking about all these ideas. And once we did the costing, we found that if you even do substandard dialysis of twice per week is of hemodialysis, it costs around 11,000 per week. And if you compare that to thrice per day exchanges of CAPD, it amounted to um, you know 10,850 rupees. So equal, if not same, uh, I mean, equal, if not cheaper, sorry. So we kept on honing the idea that there is a mortality benefit, infection. Yes, there is more peritonea, peritonitis in pe peritoneal dialysis, but clearly the catheter is in the peritoneum. So that's where the infections are there. Similarly, what about the talk problems with hepatitis B, C, HIV, line-related sepsis and AV access issues as well? So we kept on talking about these things. And lo and behold, what we wanted the population to do was to think about that there was there is another option. But clearly, you know, nobody was talking about it. So the first thing was to get people motivated about it and talk about all these things which I've just talked to you about. And um, just uh, as if my the previous honorable speaker actually talked about, it's all about ethics. It's not about me sort of saying to the patient that you need to go on to peritoneal dialysis. It's about me offering that, yes, this is hemodialysis, this is peritoneal dialysis, this is transplantation, which road do you want to follow? It can't be about, because that is unethical for me to just keep on shifting everybody onto hemodialysis. So first thing and foremost was that, yes, it can be done. And the second thing was that, fine, so if, you, if we have sort of decided, and that was something 10 years ago, that the Pakistan Society of Nephrology alongside the International Society of Peritoneal Dialysis with their help, we decided that we want to develop a PD program. And the second stage was that we just need to develop how to do PD then. Because the problem was that what we found out was that considering there were only 19, uh, 19 patients amongst a population of 240 million I mean, when I was training uh, in, in, for nephrology in Pakistan, I did not see a single patient on peritoneal dialysis. And clearly, if I'm not being exposed to peritoneal dialysis or hands-on training, when I become a consultant, I won't be you know, putting any patients on peritoneal dialysis, obviously, because I just don't know how to do it. So the first thing was that we need to know how to do peritoneal dialysis. And clearly, there's only 19 patients. You can't sort of do work around that. So the shortcut was to arrange frequent short workshops. And these workshops were three days um, usually. And uh, we used to do that every three months. So it was, we formulated a program under the Peritoneal Dialysis Academy of Pakistan. The first day, it was all lectures. What is PD, PD versus HD, how to do a PD exchange on day two. We just showed the residents, the young doctors, doctors, even consultants, if they were interested, how peritoneal dialysis is done on models. That is actually a cushion we're using, just teaching how to do an acute PD catheter. And on day three, we invited those 19 patients, if they could make their way to Lahore, and if they could come and uh, show uh, the you know interested candidates how peritoneal dialysis was done. And then we kept on replicating this program over and over again to different cities. This was another workshop. Then we went to Karachi, which is another city. And then we developed a curriculum over that. And we just kept on replicating the same program for a couple of years. And, you know, lo and behold, the interest started growing and we had, uh, you know, kept on getting more patients and, uh, you know, PD was starting to become, you know, the see, it started to see the light of day at that time. Another excellent resource, which I believe is also, a, you know, an excellent resource for Indonesia is the expat population. So Pakistanis, um, you know, who are based in the U.S., 
in the UK, Germany, France, or Australia, whenever they come for their Eid holidays or whatever holidays to meet their families, we always reach out to them and say that, hey, can you do PD catheters for us? Can you come and teach us this modality? Can you bring, uh, you know, an acute peritone, uh, sorry, an automated peritoneal dialyzer just to sort of show us how APD is done? And lo and behold, the numbers started to increase. And I'm very proud of this, that, that last year we were able to do a PD conference, a sole PD conference on this, where international speakers from across the globe made their way to Pakistan to share their experiences and teach us furthermore. The second initiative that we took was that as a part of the Pakistan Society of Nephrology, we made a statement that regardless of what sort of symposium, even if, even if the symposium is about renal transplantation, there will be a section or there will be a talk on peritoneal dialysis to keep PD relevant. And here I would like to thank the ISPD and the ISN again. In 2019, they made their way to Pakistan as a part of that conference in Lahore. That's um, Professor Edwina Brown right in the corner. She's the current president. She wasn't the president back then. She made her way to Pakistan and helped us in PD catheter placements on models, which is a, a goat skin models with goat bellies. Similarly, we replicated the same program over and over again to different cities. Then, unfortunately, COVID happened and we were really, really scared that it's now after such a long time, we've gained all this momentum. Are we going to lose this momentum? So we shifted all the resources. We made a website of the Pakistan the PD Academy of Pakistan. We put all the resources, whether it was guidelines, whether it was videos in the Urdu language, and we put it online, how to do PDs exchanges, how to put antibiotics into the PD fluid, who to contact if you've got abdominal pain. So we put it all and it was, you know, you don't have to register for it. It's just there. Similarly, webinars through Professor Joanne Bagman, who used to be the ISPD pre president uh, later uh, earlier. And then what we saw was that there was a lot of interest coming in in developing PD doctors, but there wasn't as much in, you know, interest as far as um, you know, PD nurses go. And that was probably because, you know, doctors are tr sort of trained to train doctors in a certain way. And nurses were, we just thought that they were being left behind. So we asked our nurses, we uh, delegate, uh, we actually appointed three nurses, we taught them as much as we could, and then we make them an independent system in which they could be, you know, do CAPD webinars for nurses only independently as well. Again, the ISPD, can't thank them enough. They did multiple webinars with us, um, you know, case-based discussions where, wherever we, you know, we were stuck, we asked them, they were always, you know, willing to help us out. And then, you know, uh, lo and behold, the last one webinar, which we did was in February with the current president alongside her PD nurse helped us out in reducing our infections and PD peritonitis rates. Uh, the third thing what, that we've seen which helps a lot is mentorship, local as well as international. As I mentioned earlier, during my training, I didn't have anybody to teach me PD because there were just not enough patients. So I was very, very lucky that I got hold of an ISN and an ISPD uh, fellowship and made my way to London for a year where I learned peritoneal under Professor Yacoub and Stanley Fan, who was very kind to teach me the dark art of peritoneal dialysis. Uh, what ha uh, so if you're lucky, you know, these resources are there, you can reach out to me, you can reach out to Miguel, and he can help you how you can apply for these fellowships. But local mentorship helped immensely. What we decided was that we were eight consultants, in, uh, essentially, uh, at the start who had some experience with peritoneal dialysis. So what we wanted to do was each one to teach one that by the end of one year, each one PD consultant would teach at least one PD junior consultant how to do PD. And then, you know, it will be a domino effect and teach three PD nurses from each unit as well. And what that entailed was that, you know, after seeing that, let's get one patient across, we put at our center, we put the PD catheter in and we sort of say that you can go and see that particular doctor. And, the, and on each visit, I was or that particular physician would be available to us online in case there's a problem. So this is something over WhatsApp. He just texted me that, listen, this is the fluid coming out. And we just sort of guide them that send this cytology, send this culture and, you know, vank and gent on whatever needs to be done. And lo and behold, within three days, that's what happens. Step three was the... Uh, 
Achilles heel that everybody will say that who will put this PD catheter in despite the guideline clearly saying that the surgeon can do it, the interventional radiologist can do it, the nephrologist can do it, but we just have to make sure that whoever is putting the PD catheter in has done it and has been trained into it. Um, so at our setup, um, you know, the surgeons actually do it. I, I do all my acute catheters myself. It's just a question of time because we have got transplants to take care of as well. And Pakistan doesn't have a lot of nephrologists as well. So that was the major limitation for us. So all the naysayers who kept on saying that, no, we as nephrologists need to put our PD catheters in. We just sort of said, yes, you need to put the PD catheters in. But it's, you know, at, as per ISPD guidelines, it just needs to be done by someone who knows how to do it. That's pretty similar. You can just take a leaf out of what the hemodialysis population is. Most nephrologists do not make their own AV fistulas. So I'm, I fail to understand why we can't refer patients for PD catheters when we're clearly sending referring them for AV fistulas as well. Um, the fourth step was that, you know, we have to make sure that, you know, wh whatever, you know, uh, talk is being done to the industry needs to be done en masse. There are, so we asked the Pakistan Society of Nephrology in, uh, alongside the ISPD to please help us bargain better rates. And for that, we're very, very thankful. Once they know that, you know, 10 nephrologists are talking about something. And so whenever you order in bulk, you get better rates. So we got very, very good rates and decided on, you know, we need to have at least 900 bags in, um, you know, always as an emergency pool in case that's like how we saw in COVID that suddenly the fluids we have are having a problem. So we just need to have that budget ring and inventory set up as well. Local SOP development is key, similar to Indonesia. Uh, you know, it's hot, humid climate, um, you know, the dressings need to be changed more or more often. Uh, the South Asian population is much more hairy. So the dressings do peel off very, very easy. So we had to decide on, you know, we can't just wait for what the ISPD guidelines were saying. We just sort of got the ISPD delegate across and said that, listen, we need to change these dressings twice or thrice. Um, and so you have to do your own SOP development, but you have to make sure that it makes sense and you can run it by someone. Um, and similar to antibiotics as well, Pakistan has got a lot of resistance to first generation cephalosporins. So vancomycin intraperitoneal has to be the way to go. We do not use any gram positive, uh, sorry, uh, first generation cephalosporins to cover the gram positive. So it's as simple as step one, two, three, four, five. Um, I think I am at 20 minutes. I'll just take uh, one more minute to just show you what the PD Academy did. So anybody who wants to do PD in Pakistan, all he needs to do is just write on Google PD Pakistan and this website shows up. It's not going to be about that. It'll show my face or anybody else's face. It'll just tell you everybody who is doing PD in Pakistan and the name of all the centers as well. Um, if you want to take your PD program to the next level, you need to start talking to major stakeholders. We needed to start to talk to the government as well and talk to industry as well. So Pakistan is in the process of making its own first PD cycler. It has gained FDA approval as well. And this is something that was very, very important for Pakistan and may be sort of applicable to Indonesia because I'm not too sure how the healthcare works there. That because, as I said, 90% of the patients do not end up, uh, who need dialysis, don't get dialysis because the government is unable to pay. So what we reached out to all over every Ramadan was that anybody who wants to give their zakat, we will make sure that 2.5%, which we're supposed to give to every, uh, of the annual income, uh, whoever you, uh, whoever everybody has to pay based on Islam. Can you just give it to us and we will make sure that it is goes to this particular uh, patient and you can sponsor a PD patient. And we gained a lot of success with every Ramadan. We get about 300 to 400 patients going on to PD just because of that program. And there's lots of expats based out of US who are paying for them. And this is a classical example of that. Um, the next final step was that we just, you have to take, if you want to take your PD program to the next level, you just need to go international. You have to publish. You have to make all those posters. This is something I am particularly proud of personally, that in the last WC and in Bangkok, the ISN invited the Pakistani PD program to have a spotlight session. And I'm sort of very proud to say that I was uh, represented Pakistan in that. So again, it's as simple as one, two, three, four, five. When in doubt, ask for help. 
ISPD is there. It was a major resource for us. Without their help, I don't think we would have been able to do it. It's always better to take it slow. Slow and steady wins the race. And I thank you and I leave you with this wonderful, wonderful picture from the Hunza Valley in Pakistan. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Ahad, uh, for an excellent presentation uh, about how to establishing a CBD facility in Pakistan. Now, uh, the next speaker is uh, Dr. Afiatin Makmur from Indonesia. We will uh, will now presenting a personal dialysis care in Indonesia, challenges and opportunities. Dr. Afiatin is a senior consultant of nephrologist at Hassan Sadikin Hospital, Bandung, and uh, she is a chair of hemodiasis unit uh, at Hassan Sadikin Bandung Hospital, and uh, she is also chair of Indonesia Renal Registry. A warm welcome uh, to Dr. Afiatin. Uh, doctor, time is yours. Thank you, Dr. Riyani, for uh, the very kind introduction. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good evening, everybody. Uh, nice to meet you here in this uh, distinguished uh, session of I I SPD and the Indonesian Society of Nephrology webinar. Uh, this is my... Yeah. Oh, yeah. First, first of all, I want to thank you for, for this... A special opportunity to me to share about the peritoneal diagnosis in Indonesia to ISPD and of course from the Indonesian Society of Nephrology. Okay. My topic is peritoneal dialysis care in Indonesia, the challenges and opportunities. It's very uh, uh, nice to hear from uh, Pakistan experience, and I will share about the Indonesian experience. Uh, Dr. Yen has already introduced me. So this is Indonesia. Uh, we are neighbor, and Indonesia is... Uh, Islands is an archipelago with the 270 million inhabitants with more than 300 ethnic groups and 730 languages spread over 17,000, more than 17,000 islands. Uh, and the kidney replacement therapy in Indonesia, uh, as mentioned, is the in the healthcare system in Indonesia, it's published uh, online in the Lancet. Uh, the universal health coverage in Indonesia is start was started in 2014. So we have the Soci Social Security Agency of Health, the institution that manage the universal health care, and the national health insurance system. Uh, every people, every Indonesian nation have to uh, include in this uh, program. And in the 2020, the coverage of uh, uh, the coverage of the people in Indonesia is around 82%. The target is all Indonesian people uh, covered with the NHIS. The target was into 2019, but uh, we missed it. And in 2020, it's only 82%. And all of the kidney replacement therapy was covered in this uh, program. And this is the reimbursement from the kidney transplantation and for the dialysis, including HD and CAPD also. And this is uh, our data until 2021, the incidence and prevalence of end kidney disease on HD. This is on HD. Uh, in the, the highest is in 2019. We have uh, incidence, the newly diagnosed with HD is about 69,000. And the prevalence, I mean, the people who still live in the end of 2019, which HD is around 100 and. 85,000. And during the COVID, the number of the prevalence is uh, decreased, but the number uh, of incidents, the cumulative incidents is uh, quite the same. It's around 60,000. Uh, and this is the CAPD patient. Uh, till 2020, we have around 2,700 uh, prevalence. It means the people with CAPD in the, at the end of this year, 2020. But during the 2020, uh, it, at the end of the 2020 and 2021, during the COVID, we lost uh, 
a lot of patients on CAPD. Uh, it can be related to COVID, but we don't. We didn't have uh, the number of the incidents. It's decreased because we have the lack of uh, the dialysis nurse. We didn't do the training at that time, so we we didn't open the new uh, dialysis unit. And of course, the uh, hospital, the hospital uh, decreased the number of the operation. So there was uh, only small number of uh, catheter insertion. So the proportion of, on, of HD and CPD in 2019 is only 1% of PD patient. And 2021 is also 1%, but uh, all of the patient, the HD and the PD patient is decreased. So uh, the proportion is still the same, but the prevalence is uh, decreased. And this is the mapping of the uh, diocese unit who serve PD. Uh, in Indonesia in 2018. Not all of the uh, province has the dialysis unit with the PD, but uh, all of the province have uh, already have a dialysis unit for the HD. And the CAPD program, uh, as we can see here, uh, we start the universal heart coverage on 2014, but until 2019, uh, there was a deficit in the uh, in the um, balance, so uh, always deficit since 2014 until 2019, and uh, uh, kidney failure is one as uh, classified as the catastrophic disease, and the catastrophic disease is around 22.8 percent for all NHIS expenditure. So. Uh, it will really burden for the NHIS program. And this is the cost of HD and PD uh, in million dollar. As we can see, the proportion for the HD is very high and 2020 around 25 million US dollar, million. And uh, the, for the PD is only 1.23 million US dollar. So at that time, the Ministry of Health made a health technology assessment uh, about the economic evaluation of policy option for dialysis in seasonal disease patient under the universal health coverage in Indonesia. Uh, it already published in PLOS One, and this is me. The, and the conclusion is PD first policy was found to be more cost effective compared to HD first policy and budget impact analysis provided evidence on the enormous financial burden for the country if the current practice uh, where HD dominates PD continues for the next five years. So based on this uh, HDS study, the NHIS, the NHIS itself make a study and have the same conclusion that PD more cost effective than HD. Uh, at that time, this is the number of the nephrologist, the nurse, the patient in dialysis unit. And for all of, all of the patient who has to be in the kidney replacement therapy, we only can serve around 41%. Uh, only 41% can get the proper treatment. The proper treatment, it means for HD, it's only twice uh, a week. And others, the 59%, they cannot uh, do they couldn't do the HD properly or sometime only uh, one or uh, uh, two or three times a month. So the Ministry of Health, this is because they lack the number of the dialysis nurses. Uh, so at that time, the challenge is the ASKD patient is increased. Only 41% ASKD patient could get the proper treatment. And there's some problem with the late referral and limited number of nephrologists and PD nurse. But the opportunities, government assure all people have the health insurance and all of kind of uh, kidney replacement therapy uh, covered by NHIS program. And some nephrologists and dialysis nurse have good expertise in CAPD also. Uh, so uh, the implementation of HTA recommendation, the previous Ministry of Health, in collaboration with us, the Indonesian Society of Nephrology provided a pilot project program for increasing CAPD uptake in Indonesia in 2018. Uh, the locus is uh, in West Java, 
in uh, my area with five government district hospital. Uh, this, pro this pilot project concluded in some challenges and recommendation to the MOH. Uh, this is the system for the uh, PD service. In the uh, province, we have the top referral hospital, and this is my hospital, Hassan Sadikin Hospital, and there is uh, some district hospital, and this Puskesmas mean primary health care. So the district hospital is the main uh, hospital for the PD service. Uh, in this hospital, in this hospital, uh, the patient selection uh, do by the uh, doctors uh, who dedicated to uh, dialysis with supervised with supervision from the nephrologist. Uh, if this, this hospital can do the insertion, catheter insertion, so the insertion can uh, do in this district hospital, if they uh, can, uh, cannot do this, they, uh, the patient will refer to the uh, referral hospital. And after the catheter insertion, so the patient will back referral to the district hospital and this district hospital do all the uh, uh, maintenance for the PD uh, patient. And there is this is here some uh, uh, nurse, PD nurse, who will monitor uh, of the patient. And the primary health care, uh, uh, we, we make, uh, we, we did uh, make a workshop for these uh, primary health care doctors and nurse just to make them aware for this program. They didn't uh, involve, uh, direct involve with the patient. And this is the training at that time. We trained the doctor, the internist, the nephrologist, and the surgeon to do the insertion and the nurse. Uh, the insertion can be uh, done by the nephrologist as well as the uh, surgeon also. Uh, if this is the program at that time for uh, five district hospital. And we have some uh, patient at that time. This is our patient. There are some of them so beautiful. <laughs> this is the influencer also in the Instagram. And at that time for the pilot project, we have some challenges and uh, we, we made some recommendation to MOH. The patient, the patient uh, are not, were not similar, uh, were not familiar with self-care treatment. And the, they said that the doctor didn't tell about PD as the choice of kidney replacement therapy. They were told just uh, go straight to HD. And some of them uh, fear of infection because they think PD needs sterile room and sterile procedure as in operation theater. Uh, at the time also, not all doctor has good knowledge about PD. Some doctors think that more infection rate in PD, PD more expensive than HD. And at that time also, we found that no or less incentive of PD treatment. Uh, of course, the late referral and limited number of nephrologists and PD nurse. And we made some recommendation for this. We make, uh, we recommend that we have to make a patient education program of uh, kidney replacement therapy, including PD. And for the doctor also, the CME, uh, refreshing about KRT choices, including PD and dissemination of HDA study result that the PD is cost um, uh, more cost effectiveness. Uh, it means that the PD is uh, less expensive than uh, HD to get the same uh, output. And establishing the PD incentive for dialysis medical staff, uh, including uh, doctor and nurse. And for the hospital uh, management, they said the PD reimbursement is not enough for all service, those related to CAPD, because the CAPD needs uh, the fluid, needs uh, some uh, session for the uh, transfer set changing, uh, training, and if uh, they have some problem, including the peritonitis, they still cannot get the, the good uh, reimbursement for that. At that time, the reimbursement about US, uh, 500 US dollar a month. Uh, and for the HD, they think they can get more profit for hospital if they uh, do the HD. The logistic, Indonesia is an archipelago. Not all islands are reachable. Uh, Sometimes uh, for the uh, far island, cost of shipping more than cost of dialysis solution itself. And the re regulation, we need new regulation of PD practice and have uh, we have to do some uh, continuing increased CAPD uptake program. So we recommend uh, 
the MOH to do uh, some revision in the regulation and the reimbursement. Uh, and of course, for the distribution and logistic, the distributor compliance for delivery to everywhere in Indonesia. And after that uh, pilot project, there were some follow up. Uh, and this is the existing program now for uh, CAPD. Uh, we have some education program in collaboration of MOH and Indonesian Society of uh, Nephrology. The MOH made a lot of uh, uh, flyer uh, video for the CAPD. And we make a stakeholder CAPD meeting with the MOH, Pernefri, or INASN, and including the International Society of Nephrology, the NHIS, and this is the patient supporting group. We call it KPCDI in Indonesia, and also the vendor. Uh, at that time, we only have two vendors, Baxter and uh, FMC. We discuss about follow-up of CAPD pilot project recommendation. We make some uh, meetings, some workshop uh, at that time. And some of uh, uh, ISN, with the ISN, there were renal sister programs and some of hospital focus on PD program. Uh, and in December 2021, uh, the MOH make the launching of national implementation of CAPD uptake. So the program, the pilot project program, extension to seven provinces and 32 government district referral hospitals. And uh, after that, we made some uh, meeting and uh, discuss about the program. And in February 2022, there were new regulations about dialysis unit. Uh, dialysis unit standard, all dialysis unit has to pro provide HD and CAPD treatment. It is mandatory. If they want to get the license uh, for the dialysis unit, so they have to uh, provide HD and CAPD. Uh, and the target number of patients, the proportion is around 90% uh, for HD and 10% for PD in five years after the CAPD service established in that health center. And we increase, uh, we ask all dialysis training centers to increasing the number of uh, PD training for doctors and nurses. And this is, uh, sorry, this uh, one uh, I show my area in West Java after that uh, uh, program. We have uh, West Java achievement in 2020. We make 11 dialysis units started to profit CAPD treatment. And in that year, we have a 101 new CAPD patient. So uh, we made uh, the same uh, training as we uh, did in the pilot project. And this is the newest dialysis service regulation. Uh, the dialysis the dialysis center has to have PD nurse. And the reimbursement of CAPD is uh, increased, was increased. It's just a little bit increased, but uh, it's a uh, good news for us. It's only increased about 35 uh, US dollar a month, but I think 35 US dollar is uh, quite uh, uh, valuable for our uh, uh, staff. Uh, and for the Indonesian Renal Registry study, we make a study about the prediction of CKD stage five on dialysis in the next uh, 10 years. It was my PhD thesis, and uh, the study concluded that the incidence and the prevalence will increase. And if we uh, do not uh, make a change, if the uh, situation is still the same status quo, so we will have a lack of about 19,000 dialysis nurses and uh, uh, the prevalence will increase until 333,000 people at uh, 2028. And of course, we will have deficit around 35.3 trillion rupiah. Trillion rupiah is around, uh, if we divide this around 15, 15 trillion US dollar. If we don't do anything, so the recommendation, we have some recommendation with the program, enhancing the renal registry, increasing number of dialysis unit, increasing number of dialysis training, and increasing CAPD uptake. 
because the CAPD is uh, uh, more cost effective than HD. And of course, we have to evaluation the funding plan. And the newest program from uh, MOH now is just launched last year where the Ministry of Health launched the priority program and it's included the Euro Nephrology program for three, 38 provinces for 367 hospitals. And one of the program is the CAPD. So uh, for the six, 367 hospital have to reach this level of the uh, surface. And the level, the basic level, they have to do the CAPD. So CAPD is a must now in Indonesia. And the target in this program is 5% in three years. 5% from all of the uh, dialysis patients in that uh, center. For the conclusion, so the management of ASKD with KRT is a global burden. And CAPD is one of the integrated and state kidney disease care. PD is effective uh, KRT with some advantage and increasing PD uptake as a choice for KRT met some challenges and opportunities. Comprehensive approach of real of related stakeholders give a better result uh, of CAPD program. Thank you, that's uh, all from me. And this is some uh, a picture from uh, ISN when uh, launch the major capacity building partition in Indonesia. Maybe in the next, we will have this, uh, the same picture with the ISPD. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Afiatin for the great presentation. Uh, about PD care in Indonesia, challenges, opportunity, and recommendation. Now, our last speaker, Nola Sikin Pisan from Malaysia, uh, will now presenting the role of paternal dialysis nurse in managing paternal dialysis patient. Uh, I will to read the uh, chief. Nora Sikin Pisan is the head of nurse at PD Unit General Hospital Kuala Lumpur. Hi, before that, um, can you see my slide? Yes, uh, clear. Okay. Thank you to the organizers and chairman for extending this remarkable opportunity, as well as for the warm introduction. Greetings, everyone. My name is Nora Shikim Muhammad Izan, and I am privileged to proudly serve as a PD nurse. Today's spotlight, is on the key role played by PD nurses in the management of PD patients. Now, let's explore into the main segments for today's discussion. Firstly, I will introduce the role of a PD nurse in managing PD patients. Secondly, we will explore the various responsibilities that fall under the view of PD nurses. Additionally, I would like to share some insights from my experience at my PD center, and lastly, we will wrap up with our concise summary. Peritoneal dialysis or PD serve as a lifeline for many individuals grappling with kidney-related changes or kidney failure. At the core of providing effective care and supportive to these patients are the dedicated PD nurses. These exceptional healthcare professionals fulfill a vital role that demands a blend of education, training, and hands-on experience. Education is only the initial step. What truly sets PD nurses apart is their hands-on training. Through practical experience and mentorships, we can develop a deep understanding of patients' needs and learn to troubleshoot challenges. Furthermore, it's essential that we equip ourselves with additional skills to ensure our success. Number one, communication skills. Effective communications from the core stone of quality patient scan. PD nurses must communicate clearly with patients and their families to ensure a comprehensive grasp of the treatment process, its benefits, and potential challenges. Number two, organizational skills. Managing PD involves coordinating various aspects such as treatment schedules, medication administrations, and monitoring. 
readiness must excel in organizational skills to ensure the smooth implementation of each patient treatment plan. Number three, empathy and compassion. Patients undergoing PD often face physical and emotional challenges. PD nurses with a strong sense of empathy and compassion can foster a supportive and caring environment. Number four is teamwork skills. Managing PD patients involve collaborations among various healthcare professionals, including doctors, dietitians, social workers, pharmacy, and all. Therefore, PD nurses must excel in teamwork skills to ensure seamless communication and foster positive relationship with the clinics. Clearly, the relationship between nurses and PD patients commence during the selections of renal replacement therapy, which occur during PD assessment. So what is the ultimate goal of dedicated PD nurses? Yes, the ultimate goals is to craft a plan that aids patients in maintaining their overall condition and enhancing their quality of life. PD nurses stand as the backbones of patients' journey. Through a holistic approach, individualized care plan, empowerment, and continuous support, PD nurses contribute to improve treatment outcome and enhance patients' well-being. Next, let's dive into the specific roles of PD nurses. Number one, educating patient and caregiver on PD care. Following the insertion of the PD capital, patients undergo PD training. This is where the crucial involvement of nurse comes into play. Nurse hold a pivotal role in ensuring the success of the PD training program. Dedicated PD nurses are responsible for training both PD patients and their caregiver. During training, PD nurses emphasize the correct technique for exchange procedures, care of the exit sites, infections prevention, dietary and fruits management, medications administration, and addressing troubleshooting scenarios. Open completions of training, patients are evaluates of their proficiency in all PD exchange procedure and problem solving. Let me illustrate problem solving through an example questions for a patient. Imagine Mr. A noticed that the fluid is not clear when the check is before starting cycling seasons at night. What should he do? Wait until morning to see if he uh, feels unwell? Or B, check the next day to see if it's clear up? Or C, contact dialysis nurses immediately? The correct answer is to promptly contact the PD nurse. However, if the patient chooses another response, assuming there is no issue, it becomes essential to revisit the entire issues of peritonitis. Number two, role of PD nurses, monitoring patient's progress, post-training, and respond to therapy. The rationals behind this practice is to secure the best possible outcome and to adapt treatment when necessary. Following the completions of PD trainings, it's become imperative to closely monitor patient progress. Initially, this monitoring takes place around one to two weeks after training completion. Subsequently, it's become a regular practice occurrence every three months. The monitoring approach primarily targets green tech patients, which include those who haven't experienced recent hospitalization, show no signs of fluid uh, overload or anemia, and displays no indication of infections or other medical condition. Wisely, a home visit carried out by PDNS is an essential component of post-training and regular monitoring. It's not what that study has demonstrate that significant benefits of home visit is enhancing technique survival rates in PD patients. Number three, make sure the patients record are uh, accurate and always update and document them in all aspects of care. 
regularly PDNAS engage in reviewing patient labs result, home medications, and PD record book. Moreover, we take the initiative to inform the doctor whenever patients require specific treatment such as prophylaxis antibiotic before invasive GIT or gynecological procedure or in cases of PD system contaminations. One of the key responsibilities that deserves special attention is timely communications with doctor when there are changes in patient's condition. Imagine being the bridge that connects patients and doctor, our role goes beyond just administering treatments. It is about being vigilant and proactive. Number four, order and maintain supply needed for peritoneal dialysis camp. As a PD nurse, we should take responsibility to do proper order because we want to ensure patient can commence PD exchange regularly according to the correct PD regime's prescriptions. What will happen if our patient receives in some patient solutions or other equipment? After two or three days, patient will come and comment that uh, they will use a uh, mini cap or they skip some step of procedure. So we don't want any transfer sex contaminations, touch contaminations during PD treatments that can lead to PD peritonic infections. Moving on number five, role of PD nurses, collaborate with interdisciplinary teams, members to develop individualized care plan. Interdisciplinary care plans are beneficial to PD patients and PD staff as well. With collaboration, we can cooperate working together, sharing responsibility for problem solving and making decisions to improve patient care and outcome. For example, PDNT can collaborate with infection team control to emphasize patients about hand hygiene, or we can collaborate with dietitian to educate patients about the right amount of high protein diet, protein, uh, potassium diet, and others. Next, number six, PDNAS should participate in quality improvement initiative. Though continuous review of in continuous review of every episode of infections to determine the root cause of the event should be routine in PD program. In addition, further research is needed as a main approach to decrease infections risk when we already identify. The area of improvements, the quality of patient's care and treatments will be better. Next, attend continuous education course. The rationale is to keep abreast of latest developments in peritoneal dialysis scheme. By attending education course, our new staff member also can gain new inputs, can get foundations of PD, preventions of PD-related infection, and other quality of PD program. This can develop their confidence level to train the patient. In conclusion, the PDNAS should empower the knowledge and practice to give better management to PD patient. So I would like to share my, um, my journey at my PD center. In Malaysia, the number of PD patients on December 2022 was 6,400 plus. And in my center, General Hospital Kuala Lumpur, we have about 400 patients and 16 uh, PD nurses. So in Malaysia, we have our standard operating procedure in PD management. And we um, always continue uh, using our policy and procedure on infections prevention and control in management PD patient. We also have our standard checklist in pre-operative assessments, our standard checklist in PD catheter incision and PD training as well. During PD assessment, what we have implements are, we do physical demonstrations, video, and we will give RRT brochure to make sure patient and caregiver can understand what is the best option to their treatments. PD training. In my center, training at hospital, mostly or oftenly we do as outpatient. Okay, 
uh, in passion we all we also do but in certain case that patient have logistic issue we also do pd training at home which is we collaborations with uh, national kidney foundations malaysia and vendor nurses from baxter prisoners and periton to implement training at home home visit routinely we do home visit and we also get help from National Kidney Foundation Malaysia and uh, company nurses to regularly do home visit to our patient. Okay, if you can see here, um, before we start training, we do home visit first and we can see treatment uh, room looks so untidy and we advise patient to clean up the room before we start the training. And uh, at the right, is the room after disaster at one of my patients. Okay, nurse duty teleconsultation. We empower nurse duty teleconsultation since COVID issues. Mm, because of uh, lack of manpower, uh, we, we continuously uh, do uh, teleconsultations to patient. Uh, and we also cannot um, implement home visit physically. So by uh, video calls uh, and teleconsultations, it's more helpful to patients and PD nurses as well. Helps workshop for PD patients and caregivers. Uh, every year we have done a workshop to all our PD patients. We have collaborations with physiotherapists, uh, infection controls, uh, and dietitians, also social uh, worker. Okay. Uh, retraining program because um, recently we are facing a decreased number of easy side infection uh, and we take opportunity uh, to, to do a retraining program so we can um, advise patients, emphasize patients and retraining back uh, few steps that certain patients miss. Mm, continuously quality initiative or CQI. Uh, last two years, we have um, facing increased number in pre-initiation PD peritonitis. So uh, our team, the PD nurses and doctor, we are collecting data and we are using fish bone CQI to identify uh, which um which um, part that we can uh, improve so uh, at the end we also publish a paper at malaysia society of nephrologists about continuous quality improvements in pre pd peritonitis multifaceted strategies okay lastly we also do continuous nursing educations uh, at unit levels uh, uh, at our department's level and hospital's level. Uh, continuous nursing education, usually we will encourage our PD nurses as a speaker. So um, it can develop our confidence levels to give a speech and expand the knowledge about PD management. Okay, every year we also involve a PD nursing workshop. Uh, every year, all uh, center in Klang Valley will um, we'll give uh, their inputs about uh, dressing, about how they manage PD, PD patient with peritonitis. Also, we, um, we, we do our some uh, questions uh, to discuss and, and yes, it gives a good impact uh, to PD uh, management to our patients. Okay. So, um, in conclusions, we have learned that PD nurses are more than more medical professionals. We are caregivers, educators, and advocates who guide patients through all aspects of the PD programs. Our roles encompasses not only administering 
three months, but also providing emotional supports and empowerment to individuals facing PD challenges. This greatness will have the impact to prolong patient survivors and PD survivors as well. Thank you for your attention and let's carry the spirit of this webinar forward as we collaborate to enrich the life of PD patient and advance PD care. So that, thank you. Thank you, uh, Nora Sikhin, for the uh, very interesting presentation and for the sharing of experience in managing patients on PD. So we will uh, have a question and answer session and please uh, feel free to ask our expert today and uh, the question uh, can write down on the Q&R uh, box on your screen. So here we have uh, six uh, uh, six question and I will uh, for first uh, this question is uh, from Ratih uh, from Malang, Indonesia. Uh, the question is how to make the patient understand that pernal dialysis better than hemodialysis. Mostly our patients choose hemodialysis twice a week uh, to socialize with others and with the same gift that they think that pernal dialysis is more complicated than dialysis, than hemodialysis. So I think uh, this, uh, this question can uh, answer by Dr. Ahad first, uh, please. Right. Uh, so thank you so much. Um, excellent question. Um, first and foremost, again, um, I think uh, as uh, Dr. Yenny actually alluded to, if you look at ethics, uh, it's it's honestly, it's, it's not uh, the doctor's job to sort of say to anybody that this is better than that. Our job is to provide the information and just make sure that the information is accurate and then sort of help them make this decision if they're feeling it, making it, if it's very, very difficult to them. Yes, hemodialysis has that advantage that it is a, sort of like a socializing event. You know, they, they make friends, they get a very, very close, close association with the dialysis technicians. We see that, I mean, that is something which is a pro as far as hemodialysis is concerned. Um, but if you you just have to sort of highlight what the pros of peritoneal dialysis is all about as well so you just have to make sure that they know that they've got more freedom more autonomy as far as hemodialysis is concerned so all doctors i know who unfortunately have ended up on dialysis in pakistan 99% of uh, of them are on peritoneal dialysis because it helps them work around their schedule so it's all about how you sort of word and counsel them more than anything else. As I said, it's it's I, I I don't think it is accurate and the right thing to do for me to sort of say PD is better than HD or HD is better than because that the data there is still debatable. For the first one or two years, yes, we know that PD maybe has a sub survival advantage, but that could be due to residual renal function. So our job is to provide the information. Number two thing I would sort of highlight is that we need to just streamline the process. The patient, when you tell them on they're going on to dialysis and they're nearby, they're just scared. If you send them that go and meet this person and that one, that other gentleman is going to put the PD catheter in, it just it it, it doesn't help. What I have seen in my practice is um, so we have got a very, very strong support group. So I have a lot of PD patients who want to talk to other PD uh, patients as well. So I just sort of say that seeing is believing. If you want to go and talk to someone who's on PD, by all means go that. And once they see the effects of peritoneal dialysis on the body, as opposed to hemodialysis, more often than not, they do choose um, you know, peritoneal dialysis over hemodialysis. I hope that answers the question. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Rahat. May I continue for the next question for Dr. Rahat? Is, uh, in Pakistan, do you have a role of GKD, uh, GKD said five patient as a PD first option? So, so, uh, so I, I think the question sort of says, it's is it a rule? So it's not a rule. So, you know, in some countries, they sort of say that you have to do PD first. So that's not the case. So the government hasn't made or the health ministry hasn't made any such ruling. So it's more to do with which centers want to do it. My center and another center in Karachi uh, does PD first. 
uh, but we individualize it as well, um, especially with patients who've got ischemic heart disease, poor EF, we always put them on, um, you know, peritoneal dialysis, then hemodialysis, but it's not a rule if, if the, so we don't have PD first in Pakistan. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Ahad. And the next question is, I think, is for Dr. Afiatin. Uh, this is a question from Jakarta. Uh, the question is, what do you think about the level of achievement of PD adequacy in several regions in Indonesia? Then in the next five years, do you think uh, PD will be number one compi uh, compared to HD? Maybe Dr. Afiatin can answer this question. Yeah, okay. Thank you for the question, uh, Hari. Uh, what do you think about the level of achievement PD adequacy? Yeah, yes. Uh, um, unfortunately, uh, I know you asked it because I'm uh, the chief of Indonesia Dental Registry. Uh, the PD adequacy is not uh, included in the report yet, okay? Uh, but uh, I saw some uh, paper uh in the from the nurse and of course for the for the from the uh, uh dialysis unit uh, uh who did the pd uh, service uh the level of uh, the adequacy in some patient is good but uh, most uh, of the uh problem is not the adequacy but uh, uh the problem the patient stopped the pd the problem is not the uh, PD adequacy, uh, as well as it was not nor PD adequacy nor uh, peritonitis in Indonesia. In Indonesian Dental Registry, we have the data that the the cause of the PD drop out from the peritonitis is only fifteen percent. Some of them uh, uh, is the problem with the logistic. And some of them is uh, not the medical medical uh, cause. Uh, maybe the uh, the support from the uh, from the family, something like that. But for the PD adequacy, we have not uh, we don't have any uh, specific data yet. What do you think? PD will be number one in the, the next five years? No, I don't think so, because uh, the target from the uh, uronephrology priority program from MOH, the target is only 5% in the next three years. And uh, I think it's uh, it will be a hard target from us. It's hard to achieve because 5% in, in Indonesia, it means about uh, 7,500 7, patients. You know, it's a, a very big number. So uh, hopefully with this program, we can uh, accelerate the PD uptake because uh, in Indonesia, the PD, the PD program is, uh, is not debatable. We need the PD, okay? Because we cannot serve all of the patient with the HD. Uh, for the HD service, we need one nurses, uh, one nurse in every shift uh, only can serve three patients in, in uh, every shift for the HD treatment. But for PD, uh, in Indonesia, the standard is one PD nurse for 30 patients. So we, we, we need less uh, number of nurse to service more patients. So uh, I think PD is a must in Indonesia because we need it. But number one, I don't think so. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Afiatin. Uh, there is many questions in the box, more than 15 uh, questions, so I, uh, we can answer all of the questions. Thank you for the uh, participant, uh, the audience. So we will just uh, some questions, and uh, uh, next is a question from uh, Ms. Nosa, uh, Narasakin. What did you do in order to patient with NCD analysis, choice PD, not HD? What did you do? Okay. Uh, still mute, I think. Uh, okay. Thank you for the questions. In my yeah. center, after we have done speedy assessments to patients, we will check the GFR level of the patients. If the GFR level is less than 10, we as a PD nurse have the opportunity, have the power to give um or slot in uh, 
the operation dates to the patients actually uh, and um and in my center what we have done is if the patients still have good urine output and the gfr is less than 10 um, my nephrologist will um, encourage patients to do the 10 cough incisions and we will implement uh, incremental dialysis patients. Uh, this is good for patients that we can prolong patients' PD survivors and to reduce the burnout because the when we implement some uh, PD uh, incremental dialysis, um, patients will um, have a quality of life because they no need to do like CAPD strictly four times per day. Maybe they can do three times per day. So um, in conclusions, um, in conclusions, um, in order the patient with extensions to PD or not HD, we during a PD assessment, we create a good report and give um, an uh, extra information like we will uh, give patients, uh, our TikToker patients that can make uh, the patients to be more confident to choose PD rather than HD. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for the answer. And then uh, I think for uh, for Dr. Afiatin too, uh, do we have to educate the patient regularly in order to choose PD rather than HD? Okay. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you, uh, uh, Restu. Okay, as uh, uh, Dr. Had uh, mentioned before that uh, we, as a doctor, when we met, uh, when we face the patient with the uh, who need the kidney replacement therapy, we have to educate them with all of the kidney replacement therapy. It's uh, it's the patient choice. Uh, for uh, to choose which uh, uh, treatment uh, will be uh, adequate for them. So for the PD, we uh, we have to uh, encourage the patient that we think it's better in PD. Yeah, we, we have uh, our 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 thinking uh, ourselves. For example, for young people in with the active uh, life. Yeah, uh, PD is the best. With with the best for them, of course, uh, kidney transplantation is the best. Okay, for everyone with the with the uh, end stage kidney disease. But in Indonesia, uh, we have a, a special uh, program for the uh, increasing the uptake for the transplantation also, and in, it is including in the urinary program also. But still, the the donor problem, we have a, a big problem with the donor. Uh, before they can get the transplantation, they have to choose a dialysis. For the young people, we will have uh, still have uh, active uh, life, uh, and uh, uh, for HD, they have to uh, choose two days a week. Indonesia, it's only uh, twice a week. The NHIS uh, program for the. Uh, HD. If we need more, we can uh, make a recommendation to give three times a week. Uh, so they have to to choose two days a week, not to do anything just uh, HD because the HD maybe it's only five five hours, but still have I still need more time to prepare to the preparation and and the transportation analysis. But uh, we have to uh, give the. All of the all of the recommendation, all of the uh, information about the all of type of the kidney replacement therapy, and of course we give we give some recommendation to them. Sometimes I think all of the time the patient uh, asks us as a doctor, doctor, which one you prefer for me, so we can give them our uh, our uh, professional uh, advice, yeah, including for. For me, for me, as uh, in my daily practice, if I see the patient is still active, yeah, and in a good, good condition, uh, I will uh, suggest them to uh, do the PD, the CAPD. Uh, as Dr. Had said, the the 
uh, study, the reference say that in the first three years, this is still the same, a, a PD better and after that is still the same, but still PD have some advantages uh, than HD in the, to support the daily life. And uh, there are some reference about the quality of life. Uh, a PD had a better quality of life uh, than HD. Okay, that's for the rest too. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Afiatin, because uh, the limited of time and we we still have uh, many questions. Uh, I'm sorry, not every question will be answered verbally, and but we are uh, stream up that uh, all the questions will will be answered later. So uh, thank you all for uh, for all of uh, the speaker uh, and uh, for the. Uh, for the uh, answer the, the all of uh, question uh, then so we have uh, come to the end of this session i want thank uh, to all of uh, our speaker and committee for their hard work and dedication in preparing for this event and also thank for your uh, for the participant uh, for the great enthusiasm of this session uh, we would like to express our gratitude to spd and ina sn for having this event. So uh, I'm going to give this forum back uh, to Dr. Pringo. Uh, and Dr. Pringo, time is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rani. We have reached the end of what has been an enlightening session. First and foremost, I'd like to extend a heartfelt thank you to our moderator, Dr. Yani, for guiding us through this session. To our three excellent speakers, uh, Thank you for inspiring presentation. And at this moment, it's crucial to express our gratitude to ISPD for collaborating with Indonesia Society of Nephrology to make this uh, webinar series possible. Your vision and support have been the cornerstone of today's events. And before we wrap up, I would like to invite Dr. Talang Sak, the chairperson of the ISPD Asian Pacific chapter for his closing remarks. Dr. Talangsak, the time is yours. Good evening and hi, everybody. Since uh, uh, the time limited, I'm going to spend only one or two minutes. Uh, I'm Dr. Talangsak Kanjana, but currently a professor of medicine based in Thailand and holding the position of ISPD, Asia Pacific Chapter Coordinator, and also serving ISN Ocean, Oceania ASEAN Regional Board, Jupiti Chair, and ISN Councillor. I'm delighted to join you today in the month, month Indonesian celebrate 78 Independence Day. Thank Dr. Aida, Dr. Pingo, Dr. Yenny, and our speaker, and also the ISPD and the Indonesian Society of Nephrology for inviting me to give the closing remark. Sympathy is the cause wise, as Dr. Muhammad said, and a tantalizing dialysis option for countries with the constraint but yes, the ICPD aims to increase the utilization of PD around the globe and improve the health outcomes of these patients. Trust the joint webinar between ISPD and the Indonesian Society of Nephrology is a flagship event for ISPD, allowing the meeting of, IP, uh, of PD beginner and experienced healthcare personnel mindful on the beauty of the PD, of its simplicity, flexibility, and availability. The ISPD is privileged to co-host this event, and we hope all of you joy, uh, gain lots of knowledge, and feel pride in the PD. If there's anything that ISPD can serve you, please write down any questions that arise through the ISPD website. Last but not least, we would like to welcome you all to New Delhi, India, for the upcoming Asia Pacific chapter meeting, ISPD 2023, from 22 to 24 September, which will be uh, next uh, three more months, uh, three more weeks from now, and the ISPD 2024 Congress in Dubai next year. Thank you very much. Terima kasih. Selamat tinggal. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tarangsak. 
Uh, I'd also like to thank each and every participant for your active involvement. It's your enthusiasm and engagement that makes uh, events like this a success. We hope to see you again in future webinars, and we encourage you to stay connected for updates and information on upcoming events at the ISPD website. Stay safe, stay inspired, and have a great evening. Thank you, and goodbye. Bye, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Bye. Ahad. Thank you, Nara Shikin, Dr. Yeni, thank Dr. You. Atin. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank, Bye. You. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.